Hi, I'm Connor Friedersdorf, a staff writer at The Atlantic Magazine. I'm Sarah Posner, senior editor at Religion Dispatches. And we're going to be talking today about the Democratic Convention that is just concluding in Charlotte, or I guess has already concluded in Charlotte as we take this, and, uh, and, and maybe contrast it to the Republicans. And, and, and I was going to get us started by uh, re referencing a post that I wrote about Joe Biden's speech, which he gave last night. And uh, I, I thought that it was generally a perfectly fine speech. I'm a, a fan of Joe Biden and his, his earnest demeanor. Uh, and there was one thing, however, that bothered me about his speech, and, and that was when he was talking about Osama bin Laden, and he was trying to contrast uh, the difference between the approach that uh, candidate Barack Obama had taken in 2008 and, and then subsequently followed through on, on as president, that he would go into Pakistan if necessary to get bin Laden, and, uh, and then what Mitt Romney said back in 2008, uh, which was that he didn't think that Obama should be basically talking out loud about getting bin Laden. And more to the point that uh, Romney said something to the effect of it's not worth spending billions of dollars and moving heaven and earth to get one guy. In other words, you know, of course he would get bin Laden if possible, but he wasn't going to reorient all of American foreign policy around it. Uh, and Biden took issue with that. And, um, and his argument was twofold. One part of his argument was that it's important that we uh, send the signal that when someone attacks America, when someone kills thousands of Americans, we're going to hunt them down to the ends of the earth. Uh, and, and I actually think that that's a perfectly defensible point, that, that we want uh, to send that signal just as in the criminal justice system we don't do a cost-benefit analysis every time that there's a murder. Well, is it really worth it to get this guy? Uh, we have this notion that... Uh, justice and future credibility demands that we uh, go after everyone who commits a murder. And, and I think it's you know, basically the same thing with bin Laden and national security. Um, but, but the other thing that Biden said that I really disagreed with was that uh, he, he attacked Mitt Romney and said that what Obama understood was that America's heart had a wound in it and that it needed to be healed and that only by killing bin Laden could we heal the wound in our heart. And that's one of the reasons why it was important to uh, as he put it, move heaven and earth in, in order to get Bin Laden. Uh, I, I just thought that uh, <laughs> it was really creepy to me, uh, actually, because this notion that a kind of uh, bloodlust, that putting a bullet in Osama Bin Laden's corpse is somehow going to heal uh, America's heart or heal the wound that, that we got from 9-11, I, I just think that's not how humanity works, and it kind of draws on some really dark impulses in, in humanity. At least that was my reaction. Yeah. Um, you know, I, was, I, was, I read your piece this morning. I was interested in that because I'm always looking at, because I write about religion and I write about religion and politics, I'm always looking at the conventions through that lens and thinking about what the parties are and the candidates and their supporters are trying to say, because they're, they're definitely both parties are trying to say something religious um, or say something to appeal to religious voters. They do it in different ways, but they're both, both parties are definitely doing that. And I thought that that particular statement was very sort of eye, an eye for an eye kind of justice, right? Um, but which was very different from the religious message that the, that the Democrats were otherwise trying to convey which was very much, you know, sort of your, we're all our brothers and sisters keepers and we have a responsibility to look out for each other. Right. Um, and not that those two things have, over the course of history, been um, incompatible with each other. I mean, like, <laughs> I think societies have adopted this eye for an eye alongside looking after their brothers um, and sisters. Uh, but I just thought it was, it, it was part of the Democrat, the Democrats were doing two things this year, maybe not as strenuously as they have in the, in the past couple of election cycles, but they were very robustly trying to prove that they were tough on, on, on terrorists yeah. and very robustly trying to prove that they were religious. And I think that it wasn't, it wasn't those, what weren't necessarily compatible ideas that, that the sort of retribution that they were seeking, the eye for an eye justice, uh, that they were seeking by um, killing Osama bin Laden, and not just killing him, but gloating about it repeatedly at the convention, didn't, to me, 
uh, jibe with the with the religious message that they were overall trying to con convey. Right. You know, I mean, I, I, I totally agree that they were invoking this notion of an eye for an eye, um, but that that isn't actually what. I think that Biden's comments went beyond that. In, mm -hmm. in other words, that's not what, what bothered me about Biden's comments. It wasn't that he was invoking uh, an eye for an eye notion of justice. It was that he was making a statement beyond justice. And he was saying that it was going to heal the their fact, hearts. Right. Yeah. Beyond mm -hmm. the fact that justice demands this, uh, th this is also a precondition of America healing. Right. And, and I think that on one hand, that gives terrorists too much power. Right. If, if Osama bin Laden lived in a cave for the next 40 years, uh, would America just have a hole in its heart that whole time and be unable to recover? I don't think so. I think we're a much stronger and, and more robust country than that. Uh, and also this notion that killing someone, even killing someone justly, and I think that the Bin Laden killing was just, uh, that that's somehow going to heal your heart. That uh, that certainly goes against uh, a sort of New Testament notion of, of what heals the heart. Um, it, it's certainly at odds with uh, you know, for, forgive your enemy. Uh, but I would just say that what, what heals your heart uh, after a terrible thing, whether, whether you're an individual, you know, I, I don't know how well the heart metaphor maps onto a nation, but, but insofar as his speech forces us to use it, um, what, what heals the heart is time. What heals the heart is forgiveness. What heals the heart is grace. Uh, these are the things that heals the heart, not, not killing someone. Mm -hmm. even if justice demands that you kill the person. And I think it's important to distinguish between uh, justice and keeping us safe on the one hand, uh, w which are legitimate things to do, and healing on the other hand. And if we're looking to continually heal ourselves by killing the people that are attacking us, uh, I don't think we're going to succeed in doing it. Um, and I think he did say in a very Joe Biden-esque way that it would literally heal the hearts, right? He? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did say that. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but I guess, uh, you know, I think the vice president's speech is obviously a, a, is viewed as being a lot less important than the president's speech or the, um, you know, the incumbent president's speech or presidential right. nominee's speech. Um, and I don't think, I, I think actually um, the, the, the real speech that stole the show, if it wasn't Michelle Obama's speech, it was Bill Clinton's speech. Yeah. I think that's right, and uh, I really enjoyed Bill, Bill Clinton's speech. Not because I agreed with all of it, but because uh, it, it isn't that often that I feel like a politician is speaking to the nation as if we're intelligent people mm -hmm. who are uh, able to understand at least reasonably complex ideas and perhaps open to persuasion and, and, and trying to persuade. Uh, and I like that he was trying to persuade. Yeah, and I think that he, like you said, he he took on substantive policy issues, the policy issues that are really are at the forefront of voters' minds, the economy. And I think he did a really good job at not attacking the Republicans in an ad hominem way, but mm -hmm. demonstrating that their obstructionism would stand in the way of implementing, has stood in the way of, and will stand in the way of implementing economic policies that are going to benefit voters. And I think the way that he did it was surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly, but it was very hard hitting and specific, but like I said, not in an ad hominem way. And it almost made you forget that Bill Clinton was the consummate triangulator when he was president. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was right. a pretty, uh, pretty masterful stroke there. Yeah, I think that he has always been very adept at explaining relatively involved and complicated policy things in in, in relatively simple language. Yeah. Um, but you know, my, my colleague Jim Fallows wrote, wrote a post about his piece that uh, <laughs> I almost felt like he beat me to it because after I read it, I thought, man, that's exactly what I wanted to say. Uh, <laughs> And he basically was talking about all of the moments in Clinton's speech where he would say things like, now, wait a minute, pay attention. This is, you know, this is complicated, but it's important. Or, uh, now, I want you to get this just right. You know, and, and it, it, it just, uh, in addition to the substance of the speech being uh, 
you know, partly explaining relatively complicated things to voters. He was signaling that, that that's what I'm doing, that uh, I'm not talking down to you, I'm, I'm speaking to you as equals, and I'm trying to explain this thing that I understand, that I want you to understand, and that's really important. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm sure that uh, there's been a lot of talk of fact-checking lately in the blogosphere, and I'm sure that if you went and fact-checked Bill Clinton's speech, there would be some things that turned out to be uh, a little bit off or a little bit misleading. Um, I do think, however, that uh, for, for the most part, he gave an accurate characterization, albeit from a Democratic perspective, of the different policy debates. I, I think that he was within the realm of generally honest uh, political speech in what in what he was saying in a way that right uh, there so, wasn't some other there wasn't a Jamesville had, GM plant moment in his speech. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say there there wasn't a the other. Um, I'm trying to forget. I'm trying to remember the other. Right. It was one of the other attacks. Uh, one of the other Romney Ryan attacks that, that most bothered me, uh, m much more than the James one. But I don't remember what it was at the moment. But yeah, uh, I mean, I think generally that uh, there was no attack that that struck me as as beyond the pale. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and you know, and, and so I enjoyed that too. Uh, I, I would say actually, after watching the RNC and the DNC, aside from Bill Clinton, who I think really stole the show. Uh, it was striking to me that a lot of the best performances were turned in by uh, by female speakers, and especially by Ann Romney and Hillary Clinton. I don't know if you enjoyed both of their addresses. You mean, uh, but, you but mean I Michelle Obama? They, I, mean, I mean Michelle Obama, yeah. Right. I, I think that Michelle Obama and Ann Romney both did uh, really phenomenal jobs at, at addressing their respective conventions. Well, in, in very different ways, I thought. I thought that yeah. they, they presented themselves as very different um, – people, very different first ladies. I think Ann Romney would be a very different first lady than Michelle Obama is. And I say that knowing that first ladies are constrained in their role. Um, right. You know, Michelle Obama used to be a lawyer and now her signature issue um, as, as first lady is a very important, but obviously not uh, deep intensive policy. You know, the, the, uh, healthy eating and obesity and exercise sorts of issues. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that it, the both of them, they discussed their relationships with their husbands, their devotion to their husbands, their devotion to their children. And they both had to do that. I mean, it's, you know, I think that the women have to do that in a way that you know, men don't have to, you know, they don't have to, the men and don't have to talk about how much they love their kids and that their number one job and the most important job is being a dad. Um, you're not going to hear a man say that. And I wonder if you'd even hear a man say that if he was not running for president, but his wife was running for president. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting when we have a, a female president who is married to to hear how her husband navigates these issues. Because right. Because it definitely I, won't I, be exactly I, the I same. I would find it really surprising, refreshing maybe, um, <laughs> but uh, surprising if there was a male potential first first husband, first dude, whatever they would call it, uh, mm -hmm. and who would go to the lengths that women have to to establish that really, really the most important job I have is being a mom don't worry, I'm, you know, I'm not one of these women who values her profession more than, more than, uh, more than her children. Uh, and it's kind of, it's, it's, it's not, um, you know, it's like, I mean, obviously everybody should value their family above anything else. Uh, right. And so that it, it sort of implies that women aren't allowed to be really pumped up and psyched about their careers. And so it's, it really bothers me that, that that's what they have to do. Um, and Ann Romney, I think, took it in a, in a more conservative uh, view of motherhood direction than Michelle Obama did, uh, because, you know, she even made the joke about Mitt Romney being her sixth child and, you know, like, haha, that's supposed to be funny that the, that the guy is so like helpless and not helpful around the house that it's actually like having a, right. another kid around. And you know, yeah. I, I found that sort of just kind of, you know, 
I would love to see our society and our politics move beyond that sort of thing. I, I thought that, um, yeah, I, I mean, I thought that they definitely kind of tapped into different ideas about uh, gender roles and, and the relationship between husband and wife, although both well within the realm of sort of traditional American notions of these things. Yeah, they were both um, very safe in that way. And I also thought that, uh, you know, one thing that was interesting to me, I spent a lot of time in the convention hall in the hours before the speeches, just going around and speaking to delegates. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I would just ask them, where are you from? How did you get involved in, the polit in politics? And, and a lot of times I would be speaking to a delegate sitting next to their spouse. And on many occasions when I would talk to a female delegate, and, and this is true at both the Republican and the Democratic conventions, um, there would be times when I'd be speaking to a female delegate whose whose husband was there as a guest, basically, mm -hmm. and um, and some of them were local officials. One was a state legislator, um, but actually, the way that their husbands talked were sort of like the way that the first ladies speak or, or prospective first ladies speak. In that, you, you know, they didn't talk about how their first role was was to husband their kids. In fact, they were mostly older people whose kids were probably grown if they had kids. Um, but they would say, oh, I'm just here supporting my uh, wife. You know, she got involved in this. Man, is she smart. She, um, she knows all about these things, uh, that kind of thing. So I'm curious to see uh, if, if that's how it goes one day when there's a, a female president or if, uh, or, or if there's some cultural expectation that I am not quite tuned into that is going to dictate how, how that particular person is framed. Yeah, I, I think I think it's going to be fascinating if you know, as some people are speculating now, that that first uh, female presidential candidate is Hillary Clinton. Um, that'll be really interesting because you know her husband, you know, is sort of unusual in terms of his professional. Right. Success. Yeah. I mean, that would almost be sui generis. It, it, <laughs> it would be a bad test. So we'd have to wait for the next one. Right. Right. Um, did you find yourself disarmed by the the speeches of the candidates' wives? No, I didn't find myself disarmed. I found, I, I thought that um, Anne Romney's speech was, don't be surprised, I found it to be very religious. I mean, I think that mm -hmm. the Mormon culture that they got married in and grew up in very much sees motherhood and its sort of divine role of preparing souls for the afterlife and that, you know, motherhood has this mm -hmm. special place in in their religion. And I think that in a not obvious or hitting you over the head way, but I, I could hear that in her, in her speech. Um, I felt right. like that, that played a really important role for her uh, in her speech. And I, I don't know, I mean, I think that that's still true within Mormonism. I think that, that that's um, these sort of traditional gender roles are still there, but at the same mm -hmm. time, there's a, there's a vibrant, feminist Mormon community, which has been challenging those, those gender roles, including you know, the, the, the refusal to um, ordain women or let women not ordain right. because there's no, there's a lay clergy, but let women serve um, in the same sort of role that I mean, Romney served as a lay bishop in his church in Boston. Uh, and so I wondered whether there was a, a, a generation or a culture of Mormons out there who, who looked at that a little skeptically or with a little bit of a jaundiced eye. Uh, just because they, that's something that they, um, mm -hmm. that they're challenging within, within their faith. Um, and then, yeah, that's interesting. Um, Michelle um, Obama's speech I thought was just fantastic. I think she's, she's just such a amazing natural speaker. And so, um, I just, I just thought she was fantastic. I, you know, I think that Obama during 2008, campaign got so much attention for being the great speech maker and the great orator and she completely showed him up at this convention. I mean his speech was very workmanlike last night and hers mm -hmm. was soaring and inspiring and I just thought that was kind of funny because um, and I, I wonder if it was a little bit by design because they had gotten so much um, negative negativity about him being oh just a great orator orator and no and no substance there um even though like, yeah, I, I don't know. think that, that was true but um, um i mean i, I, I enjoyed if they, if they pulled back a little bit because of that criticism I, I enjoyed both both speeches both 
Michelle Obama's speech and Ann Romney's speech, I, I thought that they both came off as very impressive women and very likable. And I, I guess my reaction to them w was actually that I, I was almost a little bit uncomfortable with how disarmed I was because I think that the, for good reason, the spouses of candidates uh, occupy this role in, in our minds where uh, they're kind of beyond attacking in, in a way. Uh, there's a norm against attacking them in the same way that you would attack a candidate because, right. you know, they haven't chose, chosen to be there. And I think that there's a good reason for that. I think if we attack them like we attack candidates, uh, lots of good people would never be able to run for office because their spouse would say, although, hell no, although I'm, I think I'm not going to go through that. may have been an exception to that. Yeah, yeah, she was an exception, and I think because she, and legitimately so, uh, in a way, because she played such a major policy role in her husband's administration uh, that she almost had to be a, a part of that conversation. Um, but I think there were also, but, in addition to that, that 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 raising questions about her policy role with regard to healthcare reform, I think that there were also a lot of very mean-spirited personal attacks on her, and and, and there have been on Michelle Obama as well. Um, yeah. Although, well, and actually on Chelsea Clinton as well, yes. in a way that uh, in, in a way that that the Bush daughters and Obama's daughters, thankfully, haven't faced. Right. Um, but but, I'm, but I, I don't know. I think that, although I don't want that norm to go away of, of not attacking spouses in these vicious ways, I also think that Ann Romney and uh, Michelle Obama are, are kind of taking advantage of that apolitical status to do a very political thing at these conventions. And that... Uh, it, it, and that makes me a little bit uncomfortable. And I also think... You know, Ann Romney and Michelle Obama are both very um, well-spoken, uh, eloquent people who are, uh, you know, also very charismatic and physically attractive and, and just, you know, all, all of these things. And surely there's some spouse of a politician or a, or a prospective politician who's thinking, you know, I'm not a good public speaker or I'm not uh, particularly physically attractive or, uh, you know, one thing or another. And I don't know if we want uh, the the voice of the spouse playing a significant role in our presidential elections. I sort of think that maybe uh, maybe we'd be better off if if the spouse, whether male or female, was just actually part of the family and not going and going around and making televised speeches. Well, I think that that is a reason why some people don't run because their spouse doesn't want to do that, and their yeah. spouse doesn't want to be in the spotlight, and their spouse doesn't want to give speeches and be scrutinized and all the rest. Um, and I don't know that, I don't know that I have an issue with the spouses being political. I just have a, a question about whether it's, I mean, it's all, it's a little bit just of a show of, uh, you know, my husband's the greatest guy. I'm going to tell you all these wonderful things about my husband. And it's just after a while, it's sort of kind of, well, of course you're married to him. Of course you're going to think he's fabulous. <laughs> I hope. Uh, so it right. just seems like a silly exercise more than a politicized one. Yeah, and, and I mean, if you think about if you think about the public trying to use the spouses to figure out, you know, I, I think that there's a trap you fall into where you're trying to figure out, oh, who is the real Mitt Romney, who is the real Barack Obama, and of course, their wives surely have insight into this. But, but I think if there's one thing we know about public figures, right, it's that. Their wives, whether deliberately or uh, or not deliberately, will mislead us, right, about who they really are. Yeah. I mean, I think that this, you know, Hillary Clinton during the during Bill Clinton sex scandal was not a, a good guide if you were trying to figure out what actually happened. Nor was uh, nor was Elizabeth Edwards during her husband's sex scandal. And you know, and I don't want to compare those two. Uh, I, I don't want to say that there's an, an analogy between those two and, and this next thing I'm going to mention. But you know, another public event recently, you know, like Jerry Sandusky and his wife still defending him. Right? We just know that spouses, for a good reason, are not uh, a good guide to the truth about someone. Well, they're, especially they're the unreliable narrators, right? <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. You know, the the at the Republican convention. I think that there was a lot of effort to humanize Romney because I think that the criticism was, well, we don't really know who he is as a person and he's so robotic and uh, he's been so flip-floppy on, on, um, on uh, 
on some of the issues, and so we don't really know who is this guy. We don't know anything about his character. We don't we don't know what he really stands for. And mm -hmm. Anne, Anne Romney was a character witness, but you know, obviously, your spouse is not a not necessarily a, a reliable or trustworthy uh, character witness in the sense that, well, not 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 trustworthy, but you know, obviously, there's a bias. <laughs> She's going to say something really nice about you. Uh, yeah. But the the folks from Romney's church in Boston were also um, brought out for that. And what I thought was interesting about that was it was supposed to tell you Romney really is a caring, empathetic guy, despite what mm -hmm. how he comes across on the campaign trail or despite what you've heard about Bain or, you know, fire, liking to fire people, which is, you know, it, that speaking of fact checking, that got taken out of context. But, you know, just the whole corporate, um, you know, profit-driven, uh, out-of-touch rich guy image. And they were there to personalize him. But what was funny to me is Romney has made no effort since then to personalize himself. You know, so he was on the campaign trail and he told um, that voter that, you know, if she wanted to start her own bit or he, I can't remember who, if it was he or she, uh, you know, borrow money from your parents, you know, like not everybody can borrow money from their parents. And so it was odd to me that, that, that he somehow still seems incapable of like following through and demonstrating to us that he is the guy that all the people in his church testified that he is. Yeah. I, I also think that there's this issue of, hmm, you know, I, I grew up around a lot of conservative Republican people who in their, in, in the way that they talk about politics, uh, you would not gather that they have much empathy at all. And yet, uh, in their personal lives, even in their business lives, uh, they show a tremendous amount of empathy. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm thinking of, of someone, I won't say their name because I obviously have an aspiration beforehand, but who is a, a, a very conservative Republican who basically favors, who basically thinks that the culture of dependency argument against uh, generous social welfare is correct, uh, right. but who has also on multiple occasions uh, taken poor people into his home and, you know, gone out of his way to help with medical bills of employees of his, uh, who, who really does live out the, uh, I guess, personal charity part right. of, of, of that belief set, right? And, and so I think it's a little bit uh, fraught to, to try and understand someone like Mitt Romney and assume that, like, his personal generosity somehow maps onto uh, the empathy that would come across in his public policy. I just think that they're different things. Like whatever you think about the merits of all of the surrounding arguments, they're different things and, and trying to conflate them is going to mislead you as often as it comes. Yeah, but I guess, you know, the person you describe, I think that's very typical of conservative Republicans who, who uh, think that there shouldn't be a government provided social safety net because they think that people and churches and houses of worship will provide those things out of an impulse to help their neighbor. And right. while I'm heartened to know that that's true, I also think that that's not always going to uh, do the trick that, that obviously there are going to be people who don't have someone in their lives or even a stranger in their lives who would do that for them. And some people, people's uh, financial or other problems can be so vast that they, you know, it's difficult for someone to help, to find somebody to help them out through that, through that difficult time. Right. And so I think that to translate that sympathetic or empathetic impulse into policy, I think that you have to be able to demonstrate I mean, I, I guess, you know, if you want to run on the Republican ticket and say, look, you know, I don't I, I think that we're just going to rely on the goodness of Americans to help help their fellow citizens. You could run on that. But I just I think that there are too many people. I mean, that's the Tea Party message, um, I guess. But there I, I just think that there are people who are looking to hear a little bit more about what else is there aside from hoping that my oh, yeah, I mean, is going to help like me out. I certainly think the American public supports a much bigger safety net than the Tea Party wing of, of the Republican Party. Um, and, and, and like I said, I just think that there's a danger of like, I think we agree that there's a danger of conflating uh, someone's personal uh, 
behavior on that issue and like their political behavior on that issue. Uh, but I would also say that uh, I think this cuts both ways in the Romney in, in debating Romney because um, he, you know, his policy record in Massachusetts suggests that uh, he does care about uh, having a social safety net and, and making it work. Uh, his health care uh, plan in Massachusetts and making that a priority, uh, you know, does indicate that, that he is okay with that sort of thing or even affirmatively uh, wants to make it work. And uh, certainly his rhetoric now is different on those issues. And, and I don't know actually how he would come down as president uh, on safety net kind of issues. Uh, it, it's actually totally unclear to me. Right. Um, well, and, and also, in Romney's personal life, right, he's been both praised for being empathetic and attacked for not being empathetic. You know, like there's that story about, um, well, you know, there's the he likes to fire people line and there's the there's the line about how he uh, or, or the story about how he uh, allegedly bullied someone, like held them down and cut their hair when he was in prep school or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, and, and so I, I think that both the church stories about Mitt Romney, like helping fellow Mormons, and the stories about him, like taking pleasure in firing people, I tend to discount both of those things mm -hmm. uh, very heavily and try to focus on, you know, what agenda is he proposing and what, uh, and what, what has he done in the past. <laughs> and unfortunately, that doesn't get you very far because right. he, it, the agenda he's proposing has changed so many times. And, well, I think and, that's and the fundamental so problem that he has is that Still, we even after all these efforts that they made at the convention to to let us know more about who he is as a person, that we still don't. We still don't, because you know you can take those church uh, member testimonies with a grain of salt, and you can also take you know as you do. Well, you take the story about the prep school um, bullying with a grain of salt, and you sort of put that all together, and you're still up in the air about what kind of person he is. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually think that um, my best guess about what kind of person Romney is uh, it, is that he is the ultimate management consultant. Uh, he, <laughs> right. he he comes he comes into a situation and he assesses it and he assesses how he thinks that it should be fixed, uh, but but he doesn't straightforwardly say how he thinks it should. Is going to be fixed. He looks around and he kind of looks at all the stakeholders and and thinks about what they want to hear and how he can package himself uh, as the person that they want to solve the problem. And so, th so there's like a double game going on, right? Uh, I think in his heart of hearts, Mitt Romney thinks that he is a very competent person who really wants to help America and help to fix things. I don't think that he uh, is seeking uh, power for some, you know, weirdly malign reason that, that other politicians don't have, right? Uh, but at the same time, I think that he doesn't think that part of his moral responsibility as a candidate is to be forthright about what he really believes. And I realize that this could just as easily describe almost any politician, uh, but, but even more so with Mitt Romney. He just takes that uh, to a degree that, that isn't very common, I don't think, uh, in American life, or maybe he's just particularly bad at, at faking authenticity. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what it is about him uh, that makes him bad at that. Um, but uh, yeah, he. I feel like also when he tries to tell a story that you think might might provide some history or background about him, it ends up telling you kind of the opposite of what he might have intended or maybe some unintended consequence. I'm thinking of, I was in Florida uh, covering the primary and I heard him give this speech where he was talking about when he worked at Bain, uh, they, they helped out Staples. And mm -hmm. he told some story about how, you know, he went, you know, he didn't sit in a fancy office around like a fancy conference room table, like that they went to to this, the office of the client, and they had to sit in these like uncomfortable naga hide chairs, and <laughs> it just struck me as like hilarious because on the one hand he was trying to tell you that he didn't sit in a fancy office and he was just helping this regular old company out, but then he had to right. talk about how uncomfortable the, the, the naga hide chairs were, and it's sort of like well, <laughs> what you know what, what if you or you're trying to tell us that you were you know, not fancy, but then you complain about the not fancy or you make it seem like the not right, fancy yeah, is yeah. good enough for you. So, uh, you know, I feel like he's, 
he hasn't, I mean, if for someone who's been in politics as long as he has, he hasn't, he, do, he doesn't have that gene for that, that skill that politicians have of like being able to relate to people where they are. Right. Yeah. And I, I think that that's, I think that's pretty accurate. Um, so, so after, after surveying the, the Republican and Democratic conventions from afar, what, what was your takeaway about the kind of substantive difference in, in the message that the two parties were, were sending? Well, I actually thought that the, that the Republicans were offering people a kind of dark place. I, I just, I know that they were trying to, to project that they were, they were, they were the party for the future, that the Democrats don't have control over the economy and they don't know what to do to fix the economy and we'll fix the economy and everything will be great again because everybody will be able to live, live the American dream. But I just felt like it was um, kind of like gloomy and I, I just, it didn't, I mean, obviously like I'm not a conservative and so the idea that their economic platform would lead to prosperity and success for for uh, the middle class didn't ring true to me. So um, maybe that's why I I kind of viewed it that way. Um, uh, I thought that the the Democrats did a really really good job of. of I, I think the the Republicans I, I, should, I should add probably did do a really good job of reaching their base. I thought that the Democrats did a really really good job of reaching their base um, by showcasing a lot of new faces, a lot of old familiar faces. You know, the, the Bill Clinton thing was genius. Um, I thought that they did a really great job with, you know, being um, affirming of uh, gay and lesbian people and really not running away from uh, their new gay marriage stance in their, in their platform. They were, right. you know, very, uh, throated about their support for women's rights, for reproductive rights. They didn't shy away from that at all. But then they stumbled mm -hmm. a little bit, I thought, with the last minute platform changes and reacting to sort of the Fox News faux outrage about the word God being missing from the platform. And so right. I thought that that was unfortunate because it sort of, again, signaled this idea that they are worried about being seen as anti-religion. So they have to, you know, like, I mean, really? Like, you really think that any serious person is going to think that you're, you hate religion because you took the phrase God given potential out of, out of the uh, 2008 platform, but you otherwise had all these uh, affirmative statements about faith. It just seemed really stupid and short sighted. Um, and also pissed off a lot of delegates. Um, and then I thought having Cardinal Dolan at the end was just kind of a really, really odd move because it just signaled, I think it signaled that they don't still don't know what to do about religion, that they would have Nancy Keenan and you know, Cecile Richards and Sandra Fluck, and then have Dolan come and kind of step on all of that and make it seem like, well, you know, like that's a, all, the, all that stuff that they just told you about, that's against religion. It's they didn't, they didn't take time to show that, you know, there are, there are people for whom this is not against their religion, that it's, you know, that it's consonant with their religion to support, um, to support these things. So, right. um, I thought they st stumbled a bit on all of that, but that overall, I thought that it was a very base motivating convention. I have no idea about the coveted swing voters. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how, how the Democratic reaction will play either. Since you focused on, on it, I'll, I'll talk about my thoughts on the Republican convention. Um, but w one of the things that struck me was the uh, foreign policy that they put forth. Um, it, you know, it, in, insofar as there was discord at the Republican convention, it was mostly about Ron Paul voters who were upset about certain rules changes and who wanted right. to make their presence felt at the convention. And I think that and, anybody who didn't anticipate that happening wasn't paying attention to what the Ron yeah. Paul camp was doing all along. So, so they played this <laughs> video that was a kind of a tribute to Ron Paul, uh, but focused literally entirely on his non-foreign policy critiques. Uh, and then Rand Paul was able to get a speaking slot at the convention, and he has pretty profound disagreements with Mitt Romney on, on foreign policy, but right. basically didn't, didn't mention any of them. Uh, and, you know, he, he's trying to both increase his influence within the party 
and also try to retain his father's supporters. And he's in a very tough spot and, and uh, you know, I'm sure I had to get his speech vetted. So as a Rand Paul fan, this doesn't, you know, sour me on him particularly. But it was uh, notable to me that they basically didn't allow Rand Paul to voice any of his foreign policy critiques. Uh, and and they then they not. trotted out, they did not. Mm -hmm. And then they trotted out John McCain and Condoleezza Rice, who <clears throat> both gave relatively uh, interventionist speeches that sort of harken back to the Bush era and the uh, so-called freedom agenda and basically made the case that Obama has abandoned this and we needed to return to it. And, you know, a, a lot, lot of people of on the left who would say that Obama hasn't abandoned it at all, <clears throat> or at least the, you know. Yeah, I mean, when they talk about the, again, when they talk about the freedom agenda, um, they're talking about what they mean by that is intervention in Iran, intervention elsewhere in the Arab world. They, in their view, the American military has not played a great enough role in the Arab Spring. Okay. Um, it, it, it's a pretty sweeping vision, uh, a very neoconservative vision mm -hmm. of what, what U.S. foreign policy should be. It's completely out of step with what voters want. I think it's completely out of step even with what the average Republican wants and reflects more of uh, a, a sort of inside the beltway uh, power of, of this interventionist foreign policy that's more kind of defense establishment and, uh, and, uh, and, and hawkish interventionist, basically. So, so, this, so that was one thing about the Republican convention that I, I guess it didn't surprise me because this is what Romney has been basically running on in his foreign policy. He's, he's been right. uh, hawk, hawkish and bellicose in, in a way that, policy advisors. It's not a surprise. Uh, you know, and not just conservative foreign policy advisors, but, um, but, you know, like Neocons, Josh right. Bolton and, and, and uh, any, anyway, so, so, so that was one thing that surprised me. And another thing that I noticed about the Republican convention is, uh, you, you know, of course they were making a largely negative case against Obama. And the biggest thing that they hit uh, over and over again, it was on signs, it was in so many speeches, was the, his, we didn't build that comment, or you, you didn't build that comment. And, uh, and it was basically the centerpiece of the whole convention. I mean, um, just again and again and again, it hit that point. And by, by the time that the Democratic convention rolled around, uh, I think most people probably forgot, <laughs> forgot about it. Uh, I don't know that, even though it seemed rhetorically effective at the time as kind of a zing, uh, and, and it definitely fired up the base, I don't know that it advanced any sort of argument or change in perspective that was beneficial to the Republicans in the long haul. Um, and, uh, and then the last thing I would have to say about it is that I, I think that Democrats this year, uh, I, I don't agree with some of their domestic issues, um, but, but I do think that they're able to describe what they want to do in relatively straightforward terms and, and that those actually are the things that they want to do. I, I think that Paul Ryan especially uh, is just... Romney and Ryan have put themselves in a position where they kind of have to mislead on their domestic agenda. Um, and, and I think that this is especially true in two ways. One way is that they keep talking about how the deficit is a big problem and a lot of conservatives think it's a moral imperative to tackle the deficit. And yet at the same time, they're talking about the possibility of war with Iran and they're talking about uh, cutting taxes, including right. for Right, and where would that money come from, right. And, and if you look at all, of, and they're talking about no tax increases, right? And uh, they're talking about increasing the military budget too. So uh, you just can't do all those things. And, well, and I think they aren't they're, specifying they're how they would do it. <clears throat> several sides of their mouths because they haven't figured out, you know, the, the Republicans love to talk about the three-legged stool. And I think that they haven't really quite figured out, well, how are we going to make all three legs of the stool happy at the same time, given that the uh, economic policy leg of the stool wants to hear us that, say that we're going to cut taxes and the uh, national security foreign policy leg of the stool wants to hear us say that we're going to be tough and possibly go to war with Iran. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to think what the, right. how the, how the social conservative leg of the stool is thinking about the, those particular tie-ins. But I think that the social conservative uh, leg of the stool is going to be in favor of tax, massive tax cuts and also a, a muscular 
military uh, uh, militarized foreign policy. So um, <clears throat> I think that they haven't figured out how they're going to reconcile that. But I think that the Democrats could hit that more than more than they are, because I think that the you know when you think about how much money we've spent in Iraq um, versus economic troubles at home, who, what voter is going to want to replicate that? I mean, I think that obviously there are some, but I think if it's posed in those sorts of, in that sort of sorts of terms, it might bring it to light a little bit more what, what they're really proposing. I, yeah, I think that, so yeah, I, th I think if Romney and Ryan are elected, fiscal conservatives are going to be very disappointed in, the, in their record and, and feel misled by it. Uh, I think the other thing that they are not being completely straightforward about uh, is Medicare. And that's a little bit trickier uh, because Paul Ryan and his long-term, you know, outlook on what the United States should do wants to basically voucherize Medicare. Right. And, <clears throat> and have pretty substantial cuts to Medicaid. Uh, in this campaign, he's running, you know, they're attacking Obama for cuts to Medicare, which is uh, partly misleading because what Obama is cutting isn't Medicare benefits, but reimbursement rates. At the same time, the reimbursement rates could conceivably have an effect on the quality of coverage. Um, but, uh, but you would never know from their Medicare attacks that Ryan's long-term vision is to have pretty sweeping significant changes to Medicare. Um, now, it's also true that Ryan's long-term benefit or long-term Medicare take uh, that, that Romney has sort of signed on to is to, um, is, isn't going to kick in for 10 years, right? And to say I'm going to be president for eight years and the most controversial part of my agenda is going to kick in 10 years later, it's disingenuous. It, 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 you can't, <laughs> you just can't make things happen like that, right? Uh, there are going to be new Congresses. There's going to be a new president. Right. If that's your plan for, for reforming entitlements, then you have no plan for reforming entitlements. And so, uh, so, so I don't, I don't know what, what would ultimately happen. I suspect that they just wouldn't do much to Medicare and, and that they wouldn't be able to push through voucherizing Medicare if they were elected. Uh, but even at with, least one with, of these, even if the Republicans want a majority in the Senate, you don't think they'd be able to push it through? I don't. I don't think that Republican legislators want to put it, push it through. And, and as far as I've seen, you know, in 2010, they they talk about retirement, entitlement reform. But then in 2010, they ran on a kind of Medicare campaign. The Democrats are going to take away your Medicare. In, in 2012, they, they did the same thing. I, I think, or they're doing the same thing. I, I think that they see it's a political loser. You know, I could be wrong. Maybe, maybe they would try and, and actually pass the totality of, of the Ryan budget. Uh, but nothing in the past 10 years experience uh, has shown me that they're serious about doing this. They always talk big about deficit reduction and shrinking government, uh, even going back to Reagan, and they never succeed in doing it. So th this could be the exception. I, you know, maybe. Um, every election cycle is different. Every time is different. But if I had to guess, I would bet against them succeeding in doing that. So what would they do then? Get nothing done? Uh, they would, they would raise, or they would cut taxes, I think, and and the deficit would go up a little bit, and they would maybe, uh, they would maybe tweak, uh, they would maybe tweak healthcare policy in a little bit more of a free market direction, maybe. So or, they or wouldn't fulfill their pledge that, to completely repeal Obamacare. Well, that is the thing that they have. Uh, that's the thing that they have committed the most to rhetorically in a way that it seems impossible that they could get out of it. Right. Um, I mean, the, I mean, that's what right. the base is expecting. It is. And so, and, and I don't know exactly what that means completely. Like, I don't think that the base demands that they repeal the fact that kids can stay on their parents' insurance until they're 26. And I don't think that the base demands that they repeal the part where insurance companies can't deny you for having a pre-existing condition. Uh, I do think that the base demands that they repeal the part about an individual mandate uh, to, to buy health care. And a lot of health care policy wants would argue that you can't separate these things or the whole system comes down and collapses. Mm -hmm. So 
so you know maybe they find a way to finesse it and unpeel some of repeal some of the unpopular parts of the legislation and keep the rest. Maybe they just uh, maybe they just don't do it. Maybe they just fail to do it. I don't know what they do, uh, but they put themselves in a tough spot uh, regardless. It and seems to me like all of the scenarios you're describing are prescriptions mm -hmm. to make the base go crazy. That 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 the base would be so angry and furious that the things that they thought that they were um, electing these people to office to do didn't get accomplished. I mean, the Republican base is, is, is tricky to figure out, right? It's oh, I like, guess I'm talking more about the, the Tea Party, the, you know, the real... Well, the Tea Party the is tricky to figure out, too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, I, they're tricky to figure out, right? Because the Tea Partiers um, talk as if they are... They, they speak as if they demand purity and will compromise on nothing less. Uh, but they're also nothing if not loyal Republican partisans. And, you know, uh, as evidence here, they are supporting Mitt Romney, who they all disdained in the primaries right now that he won the Republican Party's nomination. They, they told us again and again during the primaries that you can't trust this man. Right. And here they are enthusiastically uh, well, speaking he's more on his trustworthy behalf. than... than Obama, who might be a Muslim and wasn't born in America yeah. and all of that. And I should say that it's notable, right, that during the Republican National Convention, the Tea Party went completely unmentioned, and this did not draw cries of protest from... You mean unmentioned by speakers? Yeah, I uh -huh. mean, it, 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 if it was mentioned at all, I missed it. Um, cer certainly it wasn't a, a substantial presence. If it was mentioned, it was only in passing and in a way that I, I didn't hear. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's pretty striking, right, that the Tea Party wasn't a group that they felt that they had to reach out to and placate. Uh, they reached out to neoconservative uh, defense thinkers more than they reached out to the Tea Party in that convention. Well, did you get and, the sense from talking to delegates that people were unhappy about that? No, I didn't hear the Tea Party mentioned in my conversations with delegates. And, you know, it, that that's actually, I should say as one caveat, that... Uh, Paul Ryan, naming Paul Ryan as vice president, was an outreach to the Tea Party yeah. base, uh, and, and, and so uh, and, and so that is true. But Paul Ryan is also popular with other conservative Republicans. He's not. It's it's not like just a Tea Party thing. Um, but but so but but even despite Ryan, I expected that I was going to hear talk about the Tea Parties and maybe a little video tribute to this protest movement that helped them win back the you know it didn't happen and. Uh, and Tea Party you seem to be okay with that. I haven't heard an outcry about it. So, um, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't, it, if Romney and Ryan win, I have no idea what kind of domestic agenda they will ultimately end up pushing through. Well, that's comforting, maybe, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is it comforting or not? Um, <laughs> I was but so, sarcastic. So, you, you, you mentioned that you'd noticed uh, something absent at the Democratic Convention, and that was any mention of, uh, of drones. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I think it became a thing because there were journalists questioning uh, or raising questions about it. Um, I don't yeah. think that the d Democrats, the Democratic speakers weren't going to bring that up. But I think it's another thing where, you know, there are some moral questions raised by the use of drone drones um, to kill civilians or the collateral damage of, you know, people who are nearby who, who might uh, be killed by one. So uh, I think that, you know, again, to me, um, the, the strenuous efforts to speak to people of faith and to talk about values and things like that, you know, I mean, there's one constituency of religious ad advocates that the Obama administration hasn't given much attention to, and that's religious advocates against torture. And, you know, the Obama administration decided not to prosecute anyone who had been involved in the torture program. And so I think, you know, I mean, obviously, like all politicians are, uh, there's not a lot of honesty about real moral issues like that, usually. But it just sort of, and, you know, obviously, Republicans talk about values a lot, too, and it often has to do with, you um, reproductive or sexual issues than it does something like torture or drone strikes. Um, but, you know, I think right. that for the Democrats, you know, there is an actual real live religious 
religiously based movement opposed to torture, uh, and right. they paid no attention to it. Yeah, it, it's it's especially striking given how big uh, a deal Democrats made in 2004 and 2008, uh, especially 2008, about you know the moral case against what the Bush administration was doing and the the argument that it's immoral to detain people indefinitely, it's immoral to torture people, it's immoral to kill innocents. Uh, and, and and so to have all of those things disappear from the Democratic National Convention this year was pretty disheartening to me. I cover a lot of civil liberties issues, and I was one of the people at the convention who was trying to ask Democratic delegates about drones and covering some of the Occupy protests and the Code Pink protests. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's uh, <laughs> in fact, in... One of the videos about Obama's accomplishments last night, they they showed a picture of uh, Anwar al-Awlaki and, mm -hmm. and, and noted assassinating him. He was, for, for those who don't know, the American citizen who was, was killed in Yemen by an Obama drone strike. And that was particularly striking because, on one hand, when Obama gets questioned about his death, he uh, he, he acts as if he's never confirmed that he was responsible for it. Right. Um, well, he also and, acts like he never confirmed that there is a kill list, even though right. people in the administration, yeah. and, his and administration course, had you know, confirmed yeah, that. Yeah, his administration has been leaking about it, but but it's striking that uh, that not only is his administration leaking about it and, and some people talking about it on the record, even as he's denying that they ever do so, it's even in the campaign video <laughs> that's aired in private. Well, that's time part of the, oh, we're, you know, we're tough on, on terrorists and we need to flex our muscles about that. Yeah. Which, um, you know, <clears throat> you know, I think it's a, in large part a reaction to Republicans portraying them as being weak on, on defense and foreign policy issues. But there's a, a place where you can go where it's too much. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think that this is such an under discussed issue in, in, in the country, not only uh, moral issues about our foreign policy abroad, but also civil liberties issues about what's happening at home because of yeah. what I regard yeah. as war on terror excesses. And, and I guess one, one little anecdote about how invisible these things are now. Uh, like I said before, this is, this is the first time that I've covered conventions. And I got to Tampa at the, at the Republican National Convention. And I was stunned by, I expected there to be very tight security. I've never been in, in an environment that was anything like this. And, and I don't think that the Republicans are necessarily to blame for the difference in security at the RNC and the DNC because it's often a combination of local police and the Secret Service that are running these things. Right. Um, but, but whoever's responsible for it, uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the game Call of Duty, which is one of these like realistic uh, war video games. And they often will be set in like a post-attack United States where you're like walking around as a soldier in the streets and there's barricades all around and military everywhere and enemies to take out. And, you know, Except for the fact that there were no enemies shooting at us, this is what Tampa felt like. Uh, there was a freeway that was clo shut completely down that ran kind of through downtown, and that was empty. And, and there were multiple levels of barricades, and, and there were helicopters, like three different helicopters constantly hovering in the air just looking down on you. Um, and then most striking of all uh, was that there were lots of uniform people in in military style uniforms. I don't know if they were actual, I don't know if they were National Guard, if they were actual military, I don't think they were National Military, or if they were police in military guard. Uh, but, but the effect was to make it feel very militarized. And you know, there were submachine guns and there were, um, and, and people in fatigues. There was less of people in fatigues in Charlotte for whatever reason. Uh, but, but to me, it's, it's really unnerving and really um, something that we don't wanna do to put to, to like militarize these kinds of situations that are supposed to be these civic democratic gatherings. Right, right. Um, and, and there's a certain irony to me that, you, you know, um, there's been a lot of talk since these shootings in, in Colorado and elsewhere about the Second Amendment, and the Republicans, of course, are the party of conceal and carry. And uh, I, I don't come down hard uh, one way or another about exactly the level of gun control that we should have. I do believe that the Second Amendment gives you right to own guns and, and where you draw the line. I think reasonable people can agree on that, but disagree on that. It's striking to me, however, that the Republican Party thinks that you should be able to walk into a movie theater, right, with a concealed weapon. 
that, that basically everyone should be able to do this. For a church. Um, and yet, <laughs> as people were walking into the Republican National Convention, you couldn't take an apple or a banana. You couldn't take whole <laughs> fruit into the convention hall, right? And there's just like a crazy disconnect when those two things are yeah. both true. And, uh, and, and I don't know how, <laughs> I don't know how anyone could possibly resolve them. Yeah. Well, I, I think there, and I have to go in a few minutes, but I, I just think it's disturbing on the one hand that, that it is militarized in this way to give people the sense that they're not safe or that maybe the, the, um, the elect, the public officials in the convention hall wouldn't be safe without this kind of security. At the same time, it's precise, as you say, you know, the Republicans support people being able to carry guns pretty much anywhere they want and carry them in a concealed way and, and, and to basically let anybody buy a gun without any restrictions. Yet, if that wasn't the case, would you need to have this militarized zone outside the convention hall that went so far as to, you know, take people's apples and bananas away? It just seems like, you know, maybe if we had, you know, fewer guns in people's hands, then we wouldn't have to worry about these things so much. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, e either way, we went a long time in the United States with without having this kind of excess militarization. And, uh, you know, I, I don't buy that 9-11 changed everything. Right. Uh, especially when you have the president, in fact, successive presidents now, with, with Bush at the end of his term and Obama now, both talking about how successful their foreign policy has been and how they've decimated al-Qaeda and how America is a lot safer now. Uh, well, if that's, well, if that's the, the case, case right, why, right. why do you keep ratcheting up the security? Right. Uh, if, if you're <laughs> safer now, let's ratchet it back down again. Um, so, anyway. Well, I mean, was it clear at all who it was that they thought that they were protecting the conventioners, the delegates from? I mean, did they think that it was a, a foreign threat, a domestic threat, or that just wasn't clear? It was just a... I mean, I imagine that the people in charge are uh, think that it's both, um, and I think it legitimately is both. I mean, look, these are targets. I'm not saying that there should right. be no security there, uh, and uh, you know, there should be security, uh, but surely uh, there's some imperative other than security. And and you know, j just to cite another example, even miles from the convention hall. So, so I was covering some of the Occupy protesters, and and the presence of both the RNC and the DNC was relatively small. I think there were probably um, oh, I don't know, 40 people maybe, maybe 60 at the absolute maximum. And uh, and they would be marching down the street in Tampa and, and in Charlotte as well. I, I saw not an Occupy protest in Charlotte actually, but like another group of demonstrators that were like pro-gay marriage demonstrators. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, these protests were people marching around city blocks that were uh, – a couple miles in one case and maybe half a mile in the other case from the convention outside the secure zone. And the police outnumbered them, literally. There would be like groups of police riding on bicycles in like uh, almost like a Tour de France style peloton, like, and, uh, and they would be, there'd be a couple of groups of these police and they would be just riding around the streets and surrounding them and, uh, in Tampa, there were police on foot that were that were marching in like uh, in formation, and it it just to me, you know, again, if if you have a march going through downtown, I don't object to a few police officers being there in case someone smashes a window or in case something turns violent, um, you know, perfectly fine. But but at some point, you get enough police there where you're sending the signal that to march on the street and exercise your right to peaceably assemble, that there's something wrong with this, that right. there's something presumptively criminal about mm -hmm. this. And or that dangerous. It, and it's dangerous. Yeah. Right. And, and that's a bad signal to send to the people who are watching. In both cases, the police, as far as I saw, conducted themselves professionally, and that's to their credit. Uh, so, so I'm not maligning them. I'm maligning the people who sent them there in such numbers mm -hmm. to send this kind of disturbing yeah. signal. I think it's disturbing, too. Well, um, this is a great conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. And yeah, you're going, but uh, it was fun. Okay. Take care.